Hello, hello. All right, we are going to uh, dive into the vision speech from Family Reunion here in just a moment. We'll give everybody a second to get on. Um, um, our format today is going to be um, um, going to be with a little stopping and starting. I'm not just going to throw the vision speech up and push play. We're going to um, um, strategically not talk about Canada since I don't think any of us are serving the Canadian market. Uh, we're going to we're going to skip a couple of pieces and um, and and uh, uh, highlight some of the, the I think conversation worthy pieces. Obviously, um, there's a lot here. Um, and um, the slide deck is available. It's available on KW Connect. It's available a few other places. Um, and I have it. I'm going to throw it into the chat here once uh, once we get a few more people on, so we don't have to put it up again. Um, um, but the slide deck is available. Um, um, the recording of the vision speech last time I checked is not yet available on Connect or the Family Reunion. Um, um portal um i'm watching i don't know it's a bootleg copy um i found it on facebook it's pretty good um it is the kw copy it just didn't get released to everybody so um so that's what we're watching there's a, a couple of them on youtube that aren't quite as good they're they're cut funny um so this one um uh this one's a, a pretty decent version um that's what that's what I know, Amy. I'm going to go ahead and throw um, um, probably doo, 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 the slide deck. There we go into the chat so you guys all have it. Um, um, we may need to pop that up again um, eventually here um, as we go. Pull up. All of this stuff. All right. So without further ado, um, let's dive in. Um, how do I want to do this? Just like this, I think. Um, all right. Can you guys see my friend Gary up on your screen? Yeah, cool. Yes, we can. Wonderful. All right. Um, we are going to dive in. Like I said, we're going to, we're going to jump around just a, a little bit. We're going to stop and start. We're going to have some conversation. Um, while the video is rolling, if you have any questions or commentary, throw them in the chat, but then when we stop, um, um, we'll have an opportunity to discuss as well. So if you want to chime in and, um, um, have some discussion during those, those moments, I welcome you to, um, take yourself off mute and, uh, and dive in there. So, um let's see here we go a gentleman from spain that took him 26 hours to get here yeah my friend leo 26 26 hours is a long time could you guys hear that okay great all right hours to get here and three layovers so <sighs> y'all better be good yes <laughs> you should really think of something to say <laughs> man don't you love the real estate industry yeah no so you're getting out? You don't love it? Hey, seriously. Had to be the greatest industry in the world, right? Not only the, the freedom and the flexibility, the opportunity that we have as professionals, but on the flip side, helping people buy and sell the most important asset in their life. What a great industry. What a great industry. Well, this is um, our vision speech. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is where we go through a slide every 10 seconds. You don't remember any of it, and you can't understand most of it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was just speaking for us. <laughs> <laughs> so, by the way, we, we, we will absolutely download all this to you, so all of you can go back through this. As we, we, we talk about, um, we call it the visual speech only because in order to understand where possibly things are going, and what we need to do to be prepared for that, we have to look backwards and try to understand what just happened. So that's what we're gonna do this morning, um, basically speed dating uh, through this. So let's dive in. 
Yeah, we have some fun stuff to yeah, share. Yeah, hold up that manual. So you see these manuals they have, they're cheaters. They've got cheat notes. We're gonna cover that in an hour and a half. So here we go. All right, so if you guys have just tuned in, you've learned we're not covering that in an hour and a half. We're gonna, we're gonna snip some of these pieces. Um, we're gonna dive into um, to some of the most relevant content. We're gonna take a look at the, at the slide deck, which is in the chat. Um, um, so you can, you have that to refer back to. You can add some of those slides to your buyer and seller presentations. You can take note of those where you need to. Um, we're going to, we're going to go through um, this first section is kind of a heftier chunk. So we're not going to stop as much. Go ahead and use the chat for any of your comments. But then, you know, as we get through um, um, and we, we start talking about, you um, 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 mortgage rates and affordability. We're going to stop and have a little bit of a conversation there. Here's what I want you to pay attention to, right? What's happened this past year versus the year before? How did we, how did we kind of deflate and come back um, not only in, in the home sales world, but, but in the economy in general, where should we be? And, and I want you to find two or three key talking points that you can bring right now to your buyer or seller conversations. Just pick two or three kind of key points in this next section, which is kind of kind of big. It's um, I don't know. We're gonna we're gonna be going here for a straight 25, 30 minute stretch. Um, um, so find two or three key talking points here that you can bring to your buyers or sellers. And then once we once we get through this section, I want you to share what you took away from that. And we're we're gonna ask questions and do ahas and all of those pieces. So strap in, let's get ready to go. Right. See if I know how to work this thing. It's been a while. It'll all come back to you. Ah, there we go. Okay. So the first thing we want to do is we want to go through the U.S. numbers, the numbers that drive the U.S. Uh, real estate industry. Then we're going to jump over and look at Canada. Then we're going to jump into looking at the numbers that that uh, drive the U.S. economy and then the Canadian economy. Then we're going to take a step. We're going to look at the industry, and then we're going to end up looking at uh, going through NAR's report with you. Uh, on uh, what's happening with consumers. Sound good? That's what we're gonna do. So let's start off real quickly with home sales. This isn't anything new to you. And that is, you know, 2021 was the, the greatest sales number in the history of the real estate industry. Yes. Right? You should have had a really good year. But understand what's fascinating is that some people can have their best years in a down market and some people have their best years in the best markets. So don't, don't worry too much about what the market is doing in the end. Focus on your main activities of finding men and women who want to do business with you. If you can do that, the market will not totally drive your career. Do you understand that? Take that from a guy that's been doing this for 44 years, okay? We just, can we just acknowledge, too, that it was like two different experiences. This is the second most sales ever on record. So it's like an incredible opportunity. But we also know that people worked harder than ever to make that happen. Yeah, so here's what we want you to look at. What you want to look at is the, the light blue. And notice that in that five-year period, total sales were 28.2 million. And this is, this is, these are in numbers, right? Now I want you to look at starting in 2018. <clears throat> if in fact we hit what is projected, which is 5.9 million in units, remember you have to double that for sides. Everybody clear on that? Yeah. So by the way, if we hit that number, we're literally gonna match what was the greatest time period in American real estate history. This year will be the bookend on that. Yes. Yep. Now, so what does that mean? Uh oh. We don't we don't know what it means, okay. right? <laughs> well, we know what happened the last time. We know that the fundamentals are different than they were during the last run up. Well, let's talk about that in just a second. But that's yeah. exactly right. The fundamentals are different. <clears throat> so look at this one. So look at home prices, and that is, if you go back and and, and track real the real estate industry. The number you want to think in the U.S. you want to think is about four percent. 
So that yellow line is the long-term 4% average, okay? And I want you to notice that starting in literally 01, 02, we crossed it. And from 01 all the way to 2008, we were above the 4% line, okay? Then I want you to come over, and then of course you see what happened. And then let's come on over to today. So if we stayed on that trend line, we would, we would be at $343,000 for the median price, right? That's, it's a big number. Yeah. That is a big number. Well, and we have to put that in perspective because I will tell you for 44 years, every year always seemed, except for the Great Recession, always seemed like a great number too. It always seemed bigger than it should be. Yeah. So, you yeah. look up and you say, how can that be? 378,000. Well, we're going to put it in perspective, and, yeah. it, and it's not as, I, I'm, I'm with you 100%, but when you, but when you look at the trend line, all of a sudden you get a dose of reality and you go, well, hang on a second. We just now hit the trend line in 2021. I know, it's weird, right? Because I'm with, I'm with you. For like three years, we were, four years, we had a second trend line. We thought that the bite that was taken out of the market, the equity and the Great Recession, we weren't sure we would ever get it back. Yeah, we're about 5% above that at the end of last year, Gary. And, you know, if we get the projection we're looking at next year, which is about a 9% increase, it would take about seven years, give or take, um, at like 2 to 3% appreciation per year, so much lower appreciation to get back down on that trend line. So that's something we're going to be tracking over the next couple of years to see what happens. And you had the same issue back in 05 and 06 and 07. So it's, we'll talk about it in just a second, right? Um, so let's look, at, let's look at the annual appreciation in buckets because I think this also gives you a real insight. And remember, one of the, one of the things that, that you and I get paid to do is to bring perspective to, to uh, home buyers and home sellers. So the reason we go through with, we want to go through this with you is, of all the people in the world who should understand this, I think you're it, right? So you'll be sent all this, and you're going to pick and choose which slides you want to go over with uh, the men and women that you do business with, okay? So notice, we, let's just go back real quick and look, and you notice that from 1990 up until 2000, the average appreciation during that period was right on the trend line, guys. And then we jump over, uh, and, and you notice the second phase from 01 to 05, well, we pop up and we're double that, right? Now, I'm gonna go back just a second. Oh, hold it. Let's finish this and I'll go back. Then 06 through 11, right? We go back, we go all the way back. Then in 12 to 19, we're above the trend line again. The last two years have been the most remarkable appreciation period uh, ever since they started tracking it. Never, see, never seen anything like this, right, Ruben? No, never before. And you know, when you look at this last year, I think we're gonna talk about a lot later is inflation. And we gotta remember like housing's part of that, right? So that 17% has that inflation baked into it, just like a lot of other prices we do right now. So. You know, we're seeing this appreciation rate. When you look backwards over that time period, we were sitting at 2% basically for, you know, we look at that 12 to 19. Now we're looking at, you know, we'll see last year we saw like 7% inflation. So as that number comes down, we should expect home prices to slow down as well. They're tied together. And I apologize. Um, this is Ruben, who's the head, our head economist for KW, by the way. You can tell my low sociability, high aggression always comes out. And I forget, and I forget to do the right thing. Uh, Jason Abrams, head of industry. Jay Pepizan, head of publishing. These guys are awesome, by the way. And they work tirelessly on your behalf every day. They're just awesome. So I want to go back and look at something just to put all this in perspective. I want, to, want you to go back. I'm going to go back one more. Yep. So let, let's just kind of look at the trend line. So the trend line says that we started right above the 4% in 01. Can everyone see that? And by the way, the, we got back to the trend line in 08. So 01 to 08, you got that in your head? 
01 to 08. Now look at what was happening. In 01, notice you started going above that, right? Right? In 08, what's really interesting is, is you started going back down, but you didn't get back to the trend line into 08. And you see what it took to get you there. Interesting, right? All right. Let's go back and look at one other thing then. Let's look at uh, when we got above it. So we got, we got above it in 2021. And here we go. So what's fascinating is, there, let's have this debate. We could go another year, we could go another three or four years above the trend line. You could actually do that but at some point, something's going to happen. At some point, homes become unaffordable. And either the, what happened last time is we started jiggering with the way we financed them, and that didn't turn out well, or it naturally cools off because buyers just say, I won't pay that price. Yeah, that's exactly right. Something always happens. Everything that goes up comes down at some point. The question is, how fast does it come down and what does it feel like? Well, we have the forces, and we're going to talk about this. We have the forces of employment. We have the forces of GDP, how the economy's doing. We have the forces of mortgage rates. We have this variety of things going on, the cost of money, uh, that all play into this picture, right? Mm -hmm. But here's the weird thing. We're going to look in a second at Canada. Canada defies everything that you just said. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't, do you cheer about that? Now, by the way, Canadians are awesome, so absolutely. But when we look at their economy, they defy this idea of a bubble. Right. They've been riding above their trend line for a long time. Yeah, yeah they, defy every, they defy all, all uh, assumptions around what goes up must come down. In Canada, what goes up will be higher tomorrow. Yeah. And Gary, I think you just hit the word that's kind of on everybody's mind, right? Bubble. So we should be having that conversation right now. Like the last two years, when you see appreciation happen this fast in this pace of home sales, it, 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 it exposes a lot of people to the potential that if home prices did go down this year, for some reason, something happens. They're all exposed to being potentially in negative equity situations. So, we're looking at a few things as red flags. So one of the things we're tracking, what are median, you know, basically what, are, what is lending doing? So we know credit scores are still high across the board for the most part for what's happening with mortgages. Uh, another interesting thing we're looking at right now is what are vacant homes doing? Because back in 05, 06, one thing we saw was all these owned vacant homes. So people were buying houses, letting them sit on the market. We're not talking about improvements to flip them, just speculation and we can measure that it wasn't like three percent they were flipping them without really they just were holding them and flipping them that's exactly right right now that number is sitting at a third of what that was at the peak so we're still looking very healthy in terms of like we're not seeing signs of that speculation so right now the fundamentals essentially what i'm saying we don't look like we're too concerned about being in a speculative bubble right now but we're the risk is high because that price appreciation exposes us if something bad happens. Well, it's a tough yeah, situation. So, so there's always two conversations, and that is about what's going to happen this year. 99% of the men and women in this room only care about this year. <laughs> Admit it. <laughs> if we go, you're going to be fine. Everybody goes, party. <laughs> we're good. We're good. Um, look. Um, I read a report from Zillow who said all bets are off. They think it's, the prices are going to jump 22%, and it's going to, yeah, uh, they're going to jump 22%, they said. It, it, it's interesting, because when you now, look they're at the only ones who said that. Everybody, everybody else has said more in a line of anywhere from 5% to 9%. Right. So let's not the bubble conversation, because I, I look at this, and, and the 80s aren't here, but that was a little more volatile. The 90s tell us about it because it looks really boring to me and then things got fun and crazy is it going to get crazy again you know all i can tell you is that we made money every year yeah as a bit as a as, as as individual real estate agents uh as brokerage owners keller williams all of us if you if you literally got after it you made money Yep. I, yeah, I remember during the recession, you said you get to choose whether you participate or not. And so as we were looking at this and we say, okay, this was a record year, the question I have for you is, did it feel like that for you? 
Because if it didn't, we're probably a habit or two away from changing that and loving it. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, the, the um, yeah, okay. There's, we'll talk about that in a second. So let's look at inventory. So here's the thing that really caused all of this, and that is historically low um, inventory. And again, it, it's, it's fascinating. You can look at when, it, when did we go into the Great Recession? Well, you can see it. You, you were actually there in 05. It started in, at the last quarter of 05. Economically, they say that it actually occurred in 07, 08. But in the real estate industry, if you were around then, it, you actually saw it happen in the last quarter of 05. I remember where I was sitting when we went through the data, and I went, oh no. <laughs> if somebody said, a listing agent, we're noticing that our showings are down precipitously in 05, and that was the first signal. Well, you cross the line from being in a buyer's market to being in a seller's market. Yeah. And, you, and you saw the jump and you went, okay, something's happening. And then there we went. And you notice again, you were, you were in a seller's market during that period for one, two, three, four, five, six. And there you go. The thing that we understand, I'm gonna go back and just make one more comment real quick, okay? Because what happens is you're, you're talking to a buyer or seller and they say, should I sell, should I buy, right? And um, people are usually driven, if not majority driven by a change in their life or another decision they want to make, right? I want a, I want a bigger house, I want a smaller house, blah, blah, blah. There's also the economic consideration. And what I understand, and you can look at this with great certainty and tell someone that if you, can, if you plan to live in a home at least 10 years, it doesn't matter when, when you buy it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now we're gonna look later at the very end of our presentation, we're gonna look at what consumers, how long consumers said they anticipated staying in their home. And of course the crazy is, is that you even have any percents that go less than a year. <laughs> they go, oh no. That's risky. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. So we look back at inventory. And the thing about inventory, if we go look at this on a month-to-month -month basis, you'll notice what happened. And in, in March of 2020, right, COVID hits. And you immediately see the inventory going up. And then what happens 90 days later in real estate is it literally flipped. Everybody was getting ready for the big fall and for about 90 days, and you can see this, we'll see this when we look at the uh, uh, employment numbers. We'll, you'll see how many people lost their jobs during that 90 day period. It's like 21 million jobs were lost in 90 days, which is, again, unheard of. And this is what happened to real estate. But real estate was still selling. In other words, in the worst, employment period 90 days ever we still only had a a 4.6 month supply of real estate i mean you would have thought it would have been we have 100 months you yeah. have 200 months it didn't happen and again as as business people and as advisors and consultants to, to people that buy and sell real estate this kind of perspective is really important okay so you look over and you, you go all the way to the end over here and you realize in December of 2020, we got down to 1.9 months of inventory in the United States. Again, unheard of, never seen before. Flip over to the purple in January, you see that in 2021, it was 1.9 again, it was two. It got up, to, it got up as high as 2.6 uh, in August, but here we are again. And, and in December, we were the lowest um, months of inventory in the history of the real estate industry uh, ever recorded. Now, and people go, it's so hard. But you do realize in order to sell 6.1 million homes, you had to have 6.1 million homes to sell. So it's not that you didn't have the inventory. What you, what you had was 
uh, instant sales. Yeah, the velocity of sales was unheard of. Yeah, I think the thing that I think caught myself and a lot of us off guard about the pandemic was that it shifted what people needed from their houses. And if you look back through times in history when that happens, home sales surge because all of a sudden there's like a new demand that gets generated because people's requirements for their house shift and people who may have been settled and weren't going to turn over for three or four years, all of a sudden it's like all coming on the market at once and demand just went through the roof. Yeah, sir. Sure. Are you in a bubble? No, probably not. Not today you're not. Are you, are you beginning to blow a bubble? Yeah, pro probably so. You know, well, Gary, how long will the bubble, if we're blowing it, how long will it last before it pops? Yeah, how long? Yeah, we have no idea. <laughs> you have no idea. And because if we go to war, right, in the Ukraine, that bubble could burst pretty quickly, um, right, depending upon that. Um, the flip side is the government absolutely over um, tries to govern or the economy, right, by raising rate interest rates and raising interest rates. And um, as well-intentioned as the federal government in the United States is, never underestimate the gifts they'll give you by making the wrong decision. <laughs> and that's not a criticism. Uh, it's in the moment, uh, it looks like that's the right thing to do, and then later they look up and they either overstimulated the economy or they ground it to a halt. In other words, they, it's hard to get it exactly right, and that's literally the way, you, you know, they call it economic cycles. It goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down, and what people don't really understand is that when it goes up, the government takes actions to slow it down and causes it. And usually they do a little too much and it goes down too far. And then of course they didn't try to stimulate it and then they stimulate it and a lot of the times they overstimulate it and off we go. Right now we're in overstimulation. There's no question about that. When you were looking at the abyss, the government went out and said, we have to spend money, we have to give people money, we have to do all of these things to make sure that we don't go into a depression. Well, they accomplished that. You could criticize, whether it's Republican or Democrat, you could criticize all you want, but in the end, the right decisions were made to keep us out of a depression. <laughs> but this is what you get when you overstimulate, right? You get people that have more money and savings than they ever had before, not because they worked, but because the government gave them the money. Yet businesses applied for PPE thinking that they were going into the abyss and then they didn't and they looked up and they had more cash than they'd ever had. So now we know what people do when they have more cash bill than they've ever had before. Now we know. They don't work. <laughs> they call in sick a lot. They change jobs. Yeah, that's right. And I think this is uncharted territory. Uh, it, all of this is, is new. There's no since recorded history going back to 1776. They, have, they haven't said this before. Yeah, it's the lowest inventory on record, what yeah. we saw. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so let's look at mortgage rates. Don't panic. We spend more time on this and we go really fast on the other stuff. Because <laughs> we're only four pages in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. That's what, my, that's what our granddaughter says. Oh, no. Yep. So mortgage rates. Look, I always point this out because I have a fond memory. I got in the real estate industry in 1979. Can you see what interest rates did in 1980, 1979, 1980, 1981, 82? Can you believe that? You're over here worried about 4% mortgages. I was dealing with 17%. And by the way, sold six houses my first month. You can sell real estate. People will still buy and sell you guys. But it's pretty, pretty awesome. But look at what's going on. You're living in unprecedented times. If you look at that trend line of approximately 6% going back to 1990 for the average mortgage, look, if you got in the real estate industry 
pick it. 02, 03, you really have never experienced high mortgage rates. You've been living in the cheapest era of money. You're pretty smart, good time. <laughs> For those of us who have been this a long time, we look up and we go, oh my gosh, this is unreal, right? Yeah. Uh, people always ask the question, do you think it'll go back up? And the answer is, it no. is. No, 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 all Not the way back high. up to 17%. Yeah. No, because the, the government, um, for all its, its you know, pros and cons, one of the things it gets right is once they see how something works and they understand it, they draw a hypothesis around it, and then they, they already have a plan to make sure that that never happens again, okay? And I have 100% confidence in, in that. So what do we think mortgage rates are going to do? Well, we ended the year. They kept saying, we're going to hit these rate hikes, Ruben, and we're going to see mortgage rates probably go as high as 4% in 2022. But where are we right now? Yeah, so on Thursday, they were already at 3.9. So we're kind of like aiming at a moving target right now a little bit. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of volatility recently. So they were at 3.9 on Thursday, but then Treasury rates dropped like 25 basis points on Friday. So on next Thursday, I expect to see rates come back down a little bit. So I think we're going to be bouncing around a lot. And we're probably trending up toward 4.5% next year if they keep trending up. But if something bad happens, we bring rates back down again. You know, it's, it's going to be hard to, hard to predict next year, honestly. Yeah. Uh, they're going to look at one thing. They're going to look at... Are we still overstimulating the economy? That's all they're going to look at. If, in fact, it looks like things are calming down, they're not going to touch it. If they think that inflation is rampant, they're going to, they're going to keep raising that rate and raising that rate till they stop it. Yeah, everything happening in the U.S. right now says that rate should trend up. Stuff happening in other parts of the world right now is pushing the treasuries back down a little bit. So that's the thing we have to watch. Yeah. So here, by the way, all of that is mumbo jumbo because it all translates into this slide. And that is, what can I afford? And remember, the formula for buying a home is the price of the house plus the price of the cost of money if you're not paying cash. So when we look at affordability, uh, again, I always point out to people, when I got in the real estate industry, it literally it went from 26 to 36 percent of your income to make your mortgage payment. And look where we exist today. It rose a little bit to 16, but it's only 16% uh, of, right? Which is wild, because you saw the median sales price at projecting $378,000. It's still only 16%. That's the story. They're it's buying the payment, not the price. And it's still only 16%. I mean, I could say that 100 times, and it's still only 16%. And that's when you all of a sudden you get perspective me to go, so is everything overpriced? It is for the first-time buyer. That's the pro we'll look at that in a little while. For the first-time buyer, it absolutely is, and that's it, a challenge. It takes 24 percent of the first-time home buyer's income to buy their house, so it's always higher, right? Yeah, that's right. But it's it's a it's a big jump, and we also know that they are carrying a lot of school debt, which complicates it and is pushing their purchase back. I think that's 100. That's 100 percent right. So the so the the long-term average is about 20 percent. Um, we could we could clearly get back to that. Make no mistake about it. You keep these kind of price jumps, and we'll be here a year from now, and we'll be talking about it being 18% or 19% if we keep seeing that. Historically, how does that rank? Below average. It still ranks well. So, again, I believe these are the I believe these are the kind of charts. Uh, depending upon who you're working with, that you simply pull out, and you can show them um, time frames of this to get them to understand perspective. Okay. All right. Let me put you guys back on my screen. Stop sharing for a second. Tell me more. Tell me. Tell me what what you took away from this what are uh, what are a couple of pieces that you're you're pulling out to talk to your buyers and sellers i put a couple things in the chat and and 
Oh, Ricky, you unmuted. Sorry, did you say something? You go first. Um, well, the, the main thing I wrote down was kind of at the beginning, which was you know, when we talk to buyers now, they're so convinced, well, I can't buy in this market. I can't compete. And the fact of the matter is they don't know if they can or not. I don't know if they can or not. They've got to get with the right financial person, the right lender, and determine what they can or can't do. And maybe, the, maybe they're right. Maybe they can't. More often than not, I've found that they actually can. And then they get so scared of what the market is because they learn it from the news, right? Wherever they get their news from, you know, it's terrifying. You're going to pay, you know, $100,000 over and you have to have monopoly money and cash to be able to do it. And now that I've seen the beginning of this and I can explain to them, listen, it was the, the lowest year in history for um, available homes, yet we sold more units than any other year in history too. It, it allows them to understand that, you know what, I can compete in this market even if I don't have monopoly money. So what, they, what they're missing in monopoly money, they need, may need to make up um, with patience, yet it's, it's doable. It's still doable even in those middle price points. And it's actually very easy at the lower price points. No one's down in the $250,000 condo market. Right? Well, we get to have the the how powerful is your agent conversation. Yes, 100%. Because it's not not happening. It's just more difficult. Yep. And when you work with the right person, it will get done and you don't have to leave money on the table. Yep. And, um, you know, you see the horror stories on Facebook, people posting on social media. We wrote 13 offers and 18 offers. And every time I see that, all I can think of is, your agent has to be terrible. Yeah. Like mm. they just they just have to not get like something's missing in that agent with that agent, right? Yeah. It's doable. Yeah. I tell you what, and if you are the agent on social media venting about that kind of frustration, don't do it. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that post too. <laughs> yeah. Womp womp, right? What a great way to not work with any buyers this spring. Yeah. If that were your intention. Oh, man. Well, that's a big piece, too. Like you mentioned, Ricky, like when people when people watch the news for anything, for advice on anything <laughs> and they don't go to the source or go to the professionals who are actually working in it, who know it it causes problems. So that just triggers the, it is our job as the professionals to get in touch with as many people, educate them as best we can. But to do that, we have to be, we have to be knowledgeable. 100%. And we have to be up on our scripts and up on our, you know, this is why we do family reunion. There's no other company that does it like we do. And it shows in markets like now. I always use the doctor script, right? The worst thing in history for anybody to have is a sore spot in their body and the internet. WebMD. Because they go to WebMD and no matter what your issue is, you have elbow cancer. Right? Yep. So you get confused and overwhelmed. What do you do? You go to the doctor. You go to the professional. Just like me, I'm the professional. My industry just happens to be real estate. So don't worry about having elbow cancer and let's go buy you a home. WebMD is the Zillow of doctors. Yes, hundred yep. percent. Totally. And that sounds goofy and it actually is kind of goofy yet. I've had a lot of success with that comparison. I'm going to create that's, that's exactly that needs the to be script a that I'm going to use. Yeah. Like, Hey, um, have you ever had a, a really bad headache for longer than you thought you have? Did you ever look it up on M on WebMD? Cool. Well, with your real estate problem, let's not go to WebMD, AKA Zillow. Let's talk to the actual doctor. Hello. My name yes. is Brittany. So I'm thinking about changing my, my business motto to don't get elbow cancer, hire me. Oh, <laughs> all right. Elbow cancer is taking us off the rails. <laughs> I, um, what else did we get? What, what other things did we pull away from this to be able to... Um, to help paint a picture and bring perspective to our buyers and sellers. So I would think that somebody who is selling or considering selling their home um, and, and purchasing a, a new one 
a concern would be negative equity. What if the bubble pops? Like, what if those are the things that I would think somebody would think about? So, how do you respond to that? I always feel like I'm the guy that jumps to the head of the line to answer everything. My first yeah. question, it, it goes back to what's your plan for this home? How long are you going to be? What's your intention for how long you're going to stay in this home? Because if you're out there living your best life and you're doing your stuff and you're doing your thing and you're making your mortgage payments, I believe the only time you should ever care about the value of your home is when you buy it, when you sell it, and if you refi it. If the bubble right. slides down and you paid four fifty for this house, and three years from now it's only worth three fifty, guess what's going to happen in five years after that? So, do you really care if you're upside down in equity while you can still afford to live your best life and make your mortgage payment? And in Colorado, the national average is it cycles every eight years, right? Where it's right, in Colorado it tends to be much faster spin cycle, if you will. Yeah. So well, we, and we don't life, have we don't have as big of backslides as other historically speaking you look back to like he said back when we started tracking this data in the state of Colorado we don't have as big of a decline when we do have a decline and so our average it is if you look at the line the trend line at any point in time from now since back then in the state of Colorado you buy a house you always have positive equity in a five-year period. And like Anna put in the chat, like he said, I wrote that down twice, was you're buying the payment, not the price. Uh -huh. So mm -hmm. can you can you be attached to that? Yep. And yep. what Kathy just said is true too, right? Guess what? Even if that if that if the down if we had a downturn and you end up negative equity, chances are your rent's not gonna slide. Right. Right, rents are going to stay. Uh, best case scenario, rents are going to stay wherever they're at at that point. Yeah. What do you think, Ken? There are two specific things that I would point out to buyers that have that concern. One is the fact that Colorado is a net in migration state and has been for a while. Those trends don't change when the economy goes down. They continue for decades at a time as people move into the area. And so that tells you that even in a down economy, there's ready buyers always entering this market. That's not something that most places can say. The other one specifically for the guy that's worried about a bubble market is you point to the months of supply. When we're sitting here at two weeks of supply in a market, that means that 90% of the buyers have to evacuate the market before we get to a price stability balanced market. So that's not something that can turn over in six months time. Rates would have to go to 7% and the economy completely trash out before we'll see prices stop rising here because there's still uh, there's still 10 buyers for every single house that's listed on the market right now. So those two things are the, the simplest way to say you better jump in now because waiting two months will cost you $40,000. You, you're, you're looking at it the wrong way if you're worried about a bubble popping and costing you money in this market. Well, and for those of you who weren't in the market, right, back when the bubble burst the last time, mm -hmm. um, one of the ways that they managed affordability was with creative financing, right? And so mm -hmm. it was very, very prevalent to see a need to refinance in three or five years because because you were getting into a, a, you know, a three or five year arm with a balloon payment, you had to. So it forced people to have to acknowledge their ne negative equity situations. They couldn't live through them because they couldn't afford the payment when they adjusted, right? Now, if we look at the prevalence of what's happening in our market, tell me the last time you had a client work that wasn't on a 30 or a 15 fixed. When's the last time you had somebody buy on an arm? It happens. It's the right move for some people, but it's not the most prevalent solution we see. So I think there's a lot of pieces in that. And Gary dives into it um, just past the hour mark in here. We're not going to cover that chunk today, but it's in your, um, um, but negative equity, distress sales, those pieces are in the vision speech. Um, so we are going to, we're going to dive in um, and have a conversation. Oh, I lost my place. Where are we going to have a conversation? Oh, we're going to talk about affordability. We're going to look at inflation really quick. 
and affordability. And then we're going to come back and, um, and, and talk a little bit more about that. And then we're going to dive into the new home conversation, because I think that's a, that's a, that's a big deal right now too. So, um, haha, let's see if I can figure this out. That 7% is a scary number, okay? It's a scary number. Now, core, core uh, would be, which excludes, by the way, energy, and it excludes food, right? Gas and, and food, if you will, 5.5, a little more palatable. They anticipate, which by the way is why when you go out there, you see everything has gone up. Everything has gone up, by the way. Everything has gone up. Yeah, forecast is it'll come back down around 2% at some point. <laughs> By the way, the reason why they say that is because if it naturally doesn't do it, they're going to dang well make it do it. They, they will. And they literally call stop the economy. And because, by the way, the number one threat to democracy is inflation. Because inflation favors the rich and harms the poor. So it's one of the most polarizing events in an economy is when rampant inflation occurs and everything costs more, okay? So it's very polarizing. So, and we understand that. So as a democracy, uh, our federal government looks up and both, both sides of the aisle, both parties agree, you cannot have rampant inflation. In that they will agree, by the way. All right, so this was really interesting. So focus your eyes a second and just look at this chart and I'll explain it to you. So what Ruben did was he, took, he and his team took um, four different categories of car, gas, house, and wages. And they went to 2021 and they say, what do they cost today? So a car on average costs $46,000 today. In 1989, it cost 15,350. Now, if you adjust for inflation, that car should have cost 35000 Yeah, in today's dollars, $35,636. In April. today's dollars, which means it's 30% above what you would have expected it to be, right? Right, the real price of a car in terms of like what the you're real trading price for in first The power. real price has gone up 30%. So you look at gas and you realize gas at 351, it's 89, it was 97 cents. Adjusted for inflation, 225, which means you have a real increase of 56%. 97 cents. Yeah. Hmm. It yeah, was baby. 10, so that, but that's amazing to me. It's interesting, because one thing that I, I wish in retrospect that I put on here that I looked up afterwards, if you looked at computers in 1989, if you adjust those to current day's prices, a laptop, or not even a laptop, just a computer, would have cost you about $17,000 in today's dollars. So the supercomputer you have in your phone is a is you've you've earned some purchasing power there. I would That's say. That's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Now, now you, you can tell the entire world how you feel about the price of gas from your pocket. Mm -hmm. You would have been paying a lot in postage to do that in 1989. Yeah. You look at wages. Uh, at uh, they've increased in in in, in real dollars, uh, 13 percent. Now look at housing. Look at housing. So the price. 2021, 346,900. The mortgage on that, $1,455, guys. Now we go back to 89. Price was 94,000. The payment was 825. But if you adjust it for inflation in real dollars, look what happened. Yeah. The price of the home, 58%. Increase in real, in real dollars, today's dollars. But the mortgage, the price that you pay to live in the house, down 24%. See, adjusted for inflation, it should be $1,900 a month. But it's actually only $1,455. So Jason, when we're talking about things are so expensive, it costs so much money, and then you do an analysis, you realize, yeah, the car does, yeah, the gas does, yeah, the house does, yeah, the wages are, 
but my actual cost to live in my house isn't. That's it. So the actual cost of living in your house isn't going up, goes right back to that, that quick script that Jason shared, right? They're not buying the price, they're buying the payment. Um, I know that this was one of the slides during the vision speech that got a lot of people thinking, got a lot of uh, wheels turning. Um, who already has something like this that they're using or they posted on social media or, or that, that has been impactful in having that conversation? Because it's a great visual. I haven't um, used this yet. Uh, but now seeing this, um, I did have a couple encounters with my clients that they're just like, oh, no, we don't want to wait because, you know, it's getting so expensive and they just don't realize. And I hadn't like actually had something like this put together or anything. But now seeing it and just hearing more about it makes me even feel more comfortable just even trying to explain it to them because now they have something they can see it with their eyes you know it's not something that I'm just saying or talking or making up um so I feel like this is yeah this is really great yeah because it's this is a hard one to wrap your at around right when the average sales price is is up over six hundred thousand dollars in our area but we look at we look at the actual cost of home ownership and, and the percentage of our income. I think this goes back to, there's a slide in that first deck that we saw, which is um, affordability, right? Being at 16%, um, 16 of, of, uh, of your income going to housing. Um, that that's much higher for first time home buyers, right? And yet still that's a, that's a really reasonable number when you put it into, into that perspective. All right, we are going to um, we're going to dive in really quick to um, um, we're going to catch the end of the conversation about um, um, about the mortgage market, because uh, Gary talks about the stability of it, what's happening at the tightening and the loosening of the market. I think it's really important to understand and be able to see from from that perspective where it's going. And then we're going to look through um, we're going to. Um, um, move through, and I'm going to bump this up just a, a little bit here. There we go. Um, there we go. We're going to um, take it through new home sales and, and wrap up for the day. Um, so here we go. Okay, so let's stop there. So we saw it hovering around 69. Now, understand there probably are not 69% of people that should economically own their home. I know that that may be a new idea for you, but that around 64 to 66% is about where that should be. And when they start trying to force that number, probably anywhere above like 67, be careful. Be careful because what it means is they're starting to loosen their credit score requirements. They're starting to loosen uh, the percent that, that you uh, have to qualify for, uh, right? As a percent of your, your, your mortgage versus your, your gross income. And when they do that, they're putting people in houses that if anything happens to the economy, they will not be able to afford it, okay? By the way, in Canada, best banking system in the world, David, they act, they require you to, to qualify for more than what your payment is. Yeah, and at a higher interest rate, their qualifying rate is a full percentage point higher. In America, we try to get you in for the least. In Canada, they make you over qualify and you can't get a 30 year loan, you can get a five year, five year arm. Right, which is why in Canada, when we used, when we did on the shift tour, and we got to Canada, we had to tear off the chapter in foreclosures because the Canadian realtors looked it up and said, what's that? Yeah. In the U.S. in 2008, 40% of all home sales were distressed sales. Say that again to them. 40% of all home sales in 2008 were distressed home sales. We go to Canada and they're like, what's an REO? 
Yeah, in Canada, it was zero. <clears throat> so in America, we love people to fail. <laughs> I know, that's a little weird, isn't it? <clears throat> New home starts, okay. This is the money page. This is the page that explains everything. You've been waiting for an hour for this page, patiently. So here's the interesting thing. So in the run-up to 2007, we overbuilt by about two and a half million homes, okay? Great Recession hits, and here we go, okay? Now we underbuilt during the Great Recession a little over 5.1 million homes. We, we underbuilt. So do the subtra subtraction, and you realize we're about two and a half million homes that we don't have that we should have had. The historical average is a thousand. I'm sorry, a million. Right? A million starts a year. We are two and a half million below that. And you look at this rate, just look at 2021 as an example. So you're 123,000 over. You do realize that it'll take you 18 years at that pace to get back to the trend line. 18 freaking years. So when you talk about a balloon, or right, and this, uh, this bubble bursting, right? When you talk about all oh, what's gonna happen, what's gonna happen, it all begins and ends right here. Well, and, and this is one of the key reasons that we, we started the new homes division. It wasn't, we didn't just like make it up on the Uber ride to the office one day. Like we, we looked at the dials and said, what are the things that are gonna be driving the industry? You're really well served to go back and look at your market and see where you fall historically, locally, and figure out if that vertical makes sense for your business. And, and oh, by the way, <clears throat> go invent new builders. Go, go find land, right? Buy dirt. Go find dirt. I mean, right now, go find, as a realtor, go find dirt. As a market center, together, go find dirt. Go find people with land and show them what to build. You know better than anybody what they should build, right? Yes, you should do this. This is exactly what you should go do right now. I am mind melding with you. You are going <laughs> to go. Somebody's got to do it. It's where the greatest opportunity in the real estate industry lies right now, more than anything else, is we have a lack of inventory. You want to solve the problem? Go find the inventory in the next few years and bring it to the market, okay? New home sales, <clears throat> the national average, historical average is 650,000, but it's mainly because uh, it doesn't count custom homes <clears throat> and there's always a lag time. So, all right, student Go buy dirt. That's a very clear and direct message, right? There is no, no mincing words there. Go buy dirt. That is the greatest opportunity, right? We have to, the only way we solve the inventory problem is a ton of people exiting the market. Where are they going to go, right? I mean, they have to live somewhere. So that's not, that's not a solution or we have to have, we have to have more homes to sell. Um, and Ken, I know that, uh, um, in Atlanta, you, um, you work with builders, right. And, and have a lot of, a lot of dirt operation. Yes. Um, one of my builders right now is in the process of zoning a 50 lot neighborhood. Uh, we also are waiting on zoning to start a 64 lot neighborhood. So our next three years of inventory is rapidly well, rapidly is an interesting word when you're talking land. Um, in the next two quarters, we should put enough land on the ground to keep that builder busy for the next three years. But that's also a year plus timeline of lead up to get to that. Um, we've been working on that deal for a while. Uh, the other two builders I have are, we're just trying to find the scraps of what's left over from available inventory. Um, it's hard, hard. You gotta, you gotta hit a certain level of, of market size before you can even go get a land deal in Atlanta. And it's infinitely harder here in Denver. At least I would assume that it is based on the, the uh, environmental issues that you have here that we don't have there. 
there's almost no barriers to developing land in Georgia other than the price of the land and the price to develop the lots. And as long as you can affordably build homes, you can go into almost any surrounding county and find land to do it. Um, you guys have issues with water and, and infrastructure and set asides for green space that, you know, if we don't have that problem in Georgia, it's all green space. <laughs> and that Atlanta market, right, is, is growing substantially, right? I mean, you, do you see a change in that demand for inventory in the coming years? Um, that's an interesting question. The, the, the demand in the, in the Atlanta market is interesting. Atlanta is about 30 years ahead of Denver in terms of life cycle of how, the, of how a city grows. I mean, if you look at those towns in the Midwest and you look at some of the other places um, where, industry, where industry has been huge and then they're, they're losing people and they're moving somewhere else. Atlanta has been a net in migration city since the 70s. So you're talking 50, 60 plus years of, of an active governmental infrastructure that says we want people to come here. And so they set it up that way. The, the issue Atlanta's gonna have, and one of the reasons why I've looked to do another market that's at a timeline like Atlanta um, is that traffic is gonna stop that. Uh, the traffic is so bad in Atlanta now, you're, you're getting you're getting situations where the average Atlanta commute is an hour one way. I mean, if you put an hour commute one way on a person for Denver, they'd kill themselves. So um, it's just, it's insane. So um, that's, that's the only thing that's going to hold that back is the infrastructure of, of being able to get cars around because there's really no mass transit there. Um, but yeah, it's still, it's getting more competitive, but it's still got a lot of, lot left before it starts to turn to a, a net out migration city so yeah there's still plenty to do out there yeah. and that should give you I mean as far as what I'm looking at when I come to Denver and look at at Denver as a market it's Atlanta 30 years ago and that's one of the reasons I moved here is that you know what does that look like not just for new construction but overall real estate people are going to continue to move here for quite a while. We're not anywhere near full. I mean, I guess the single greatest natural barrier you're going to have is water supply. Um, but there's enough of that to, to, to continue growing for another 20, 30 years, at least from what I've seen in the research I've done on it. So it's not going to go away anytime soon. Oh, and there's, there's lots of opportunity. Um, um, even though it doesn't feel like it, right? You've got to, you've got to look for it and you've got to be really strategic about what, where are we going next, right? We're certainly, you know, Denver's not growing further west, right? We've got some natural barriers in place. Um, um, but what does that look like for us to be expanding north, south, and east, right? And, uh, and what are some of the opportunities there? And, um, You know, I, I hear I hear people who are thinking about, like, say, custom homes, right? One piece of land talking about how expensive the land is, right? It was expensive five years ago, too. And yet, if you bought that land five years ago, how grateful are you today that you bought that land five years ago, right? The very same thing five years from now. Right. Yeah. I, I definitely see an opportunity for an, an if an agent wants to, you, you really have whatever you're going to do, if you're going to get into land and, and into that type of thing, you've got to master that, pro, that, that process start to finish. So the, the real opportunity for a, a single agent that wants to get into it, you're not going to do neighborhoods like I'm able to do in Georgia here that I can see because the, the cost to get into it, the, the builder has to be huge. But if you were to specialize in, two acre, three acre, five acre parcels that are out. Um, and then you team up with a custom builder or you work on, or on being the land guy to get the, the value. The hard part for builders is not getting an agent to sell their house. The hard part for builders is finding the land and finding a deal that works financially for them. And if you can master mm -hmm. that process, they'll let you sell the house for nothing. I mean, I make my money in Georgia selling houses for builders 
and that's the least work I do for them. I, that's not where my value is. My value is, is having my builder tell me, hey, I want to do this neighborhood. What are we going to have to do? And helping him find the land planner and the surveyor and get him with the grading guy that's got to figure out what the roads look like and the expenses for that and get him with the right banks to be able to finance his projects. That's where I really make my money in Atlanta is that I have to master all these other things other than real estate to be able to sell the real estate because the real estate's where I make my money, but that's not the value that I add for my client. Um, I'm going to pull this up really quick. Here we go. Let me see where it's at. Um, I don't know. I don't know if anybody has is a buyer for something like this or has somebody, um, maybe a custom home builder, somebody who's been looking to get into, you know, small development. Um, but I very recently um, uh, met with an agent who at some point towards the end of this month um, has what looks like um, a three lot parcel in Aurora coming on. One of those lots has what probably is a scrape on it. Um, and, and she's thinking they're going to be in the high sixes, low sevens on that. Um, it's already zoned multifamily. Um, and has been subdivided to those three lots. So there's a lot of potential there. Um, I'm not entirely sure she knows what she's sitting on. But I suspect it could be a good deal. So if anybody has something like that um, um, or, or somebody or wants to go shopping for a person who might be interested in that or partner with somebody, let me know. Um, um, I'll get y'all connected. Cool. Um, I, I know we're we're over time for today. We're um, seven minutes over. We had some really great conversations. There's a ton of meat in that. Um, I'm, I'm gonna throw I'm gonna throw all of the links into the chat here really quick so that you can come and grab them. Some of them are irrelevant um, actually. Now that I'm putting them in there, you don't need the Zoom link chat, but you can have all of the other ones. Um, I guess it's only two at that point. So um, this particular bootleg is available on Facebook. I don't know when KW Connect's going to release like the official version, um, but go for it. Watch it at your heart's content. Um, um, it goes for a while. Um, um, I threw the slides already in the chat so you can download those. And if you're interested in one of those buy dirt shirts, they're, um, you know, they're not available on KW Connect yet and they are close to available um, or on, on Red Label or whatever, but you can pre-order them, I think, um, and get it in a month or so. So there's the link to get your buy dirt shirt. Uh, next week, we're going to be tackling a conversation that has been the hot topic of busy agents in this market, um, burnout, mm. uh, burnout and fatigue and, and how, how you, um, how you manage that. So next Tuesday at two o'clock, we've got a watch party on the, um, um, Amy might have to jump in and give us the official name because I can't remember what it is, but it was the burnout breakout session from uh, family reunion. So we're going to be tackling that over the coming weeks. You'll also, um, we're going to break down the um, keynote speech and a couple of other of uh, the uh, breakout sessions, just like we did today. We're going to be stopping and starting, having some conversations and, and hopefully um, um, making this a real impactful way for you to take action immediately on some of this information. Um, even if you're hearing it for a second or a third, or for me, like the fifth time, cause I had to go through this a couple of times in advance to see where I wanted to stop and start for y'all. Um, it's, it's a good way to digest some of this. Amy, did you find the name of that? Yep. Looking for it. And, um, the video is not here right now. So. Ah, ha, ha, isn't that funny? Uh, yeah. That's funny. Oh, I have it here. Protect your energy through physical health, general wellness, and avoiding burnout. Doesn't that sound like a good idea? Yeah. Yeah. I Tuesday, at two o'clock. <laughs> Tuesday at two o'clock. We're going to be sharing that good idea with you. Um, yeah. 
um, between now and then there's probably uh, probably a couple of a couple of uh, ways we're going to bump into each other um, but if not we'll see you on Tuesday. Hey Anna. Yeah. These watch parties are they just going to kind of bounce around the schedule as far as daily week morning afternoon and all of those things. Yeah, I think I think right now we're looking at two o'clock being a really good time for them um, and probably on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, we're just looking at, at predefined schedules and what content's available since they're releasing this content kind of slowly. Um, so, um, yep, 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 yep. That's as far as we are planned at this point. Um, I think we've got, we are penciled in for something on Thursday, the 17th at two o'clock. We're just not sure what the content's going to be that day. It's going to, we haven't decided yet. So if you have a vote, you can certainly, uh, get that our direction and, and we'll consider all of those. Um, uh, but it's going to depend on the available content for us to share. Cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great question. Anything else, guys? Cool. Invite all your friends next time. These, just so you know, these watch parties are open to anybody who wants to come. So all my friends are already here. Oh, you have more friends than just us. I know it. <laughs> oh goodness well and it is uh it is streaming on our facebook page as well yet the um um the upside of being live on the zoom is we get this interaction we get to ask questions we get to pull polls we get to uh um you know have a little bit of community with one another so we'll see you next tuesday guys bye